Uh, be seated. Glad you're here with us. If you're a guest, thank you for being with us. If you're a member, look around and see if you find a guest. Make sure you greet them and welcome them. Uh, we always love to have people that are visiting with us and hope that you will decide to stay with us and be a part of our family. We always love to grow our family of God together. A lot of things, as Chip mentioned, are happening right now. Connect Sunday is a big Sunday for us. Chip will be speaking next Sunday. Looking forward to that. Looking forward to having all our college students back. It's always it's such a refreshing time of the year to see all our uh, students back. We got several here with us this morning. Always glad to have them and the parents. Make sure, plan, listen, listen. Do not go out to eat next week. Do not go out to eat next week. We have famous chefs preparing a great meal, right Lloyd? Uh, you and Steve, preparing a great meal for us next week. We want you to stay here, come stay eat. And we want you to go to a table and, uh, or if you see somebody you don't know, say, hey, I'm buying today, come on in. Because it's free, you can say that I guess. You gave contributions so you're buying. And uh, invite them to stay, eat, break bread, get to know them a little bit, it'll be a blessing. You'll make a new friend and maybe you might can make a lifetime friend out of this. So be sure and be a part of that if you will. Uh, now you have around you, and if you didn't get one and you want two of these, there's two different cards. You might have noticed those when you came in. I want you to grab those real quick. Lloyd has some extras. If you didn't get these two cards, they look the same, but they're not the same. On one card it says, share some blessing or something you're grateful for. Raise your hand if you don't have these and you'd like to have those. Hold your hand up high, and Lloyd will be around just a second while, while we're talking about this. And the other one says, share some resentment, grudge, or envy, <coughs> excuse me, you have or had had in the past. Here's what I want you to do. Take a few minutes. All I want you to do is write down on one thing or two things on the card that says, share some resentment, grudge, or envy you've had in the past or have now. Do that real quick. Just take a few minutes to do that if you would. And then when you're done with that, go to the other card and share some blessing or something you're grateful for. And then write that on that card. I, uh, for this to have real meaning for you, really do this. No one's going to, don't put your name on it. Don't pa we're not going to pass these in. They're yours to keep, okay? I'll come back to this a little later in the lesson. So be sure and do that. Fill those out. Then I want you to stick those in your pocket or your Bible. And then I want you to get your Bible out and your notes out. And we'll get started on our lesson today. So hold on to that. Again, we'll come back to that in just a moment. One of the hardest lessons <coughs> of life concerns our hearts and relates to some sense of fairness in our lives. It really does. We have this innate sense of wanting to be fair in life. So we're going to take just a moment and go down memory lane. I want you to go down memory lane with me. And uh, for some of us, that's, uh, that may be too far a trip to go back to your childhood. So Lloyd, you might think about your children. And, and, and as an illustrated purpose for that. I want you to think of something that, uh, that you said in the past that kind of sticks with you uh, or what your children have said historically in the past. Uh, they might have said something like, I love you and that has stuck with you for uh, many of us. You might remember saying that to your parents that you've used that expression. More likely you've probably heard or used this expression over and over again. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And I know we've probably shared the expressions, the, at least I did this expression a lot. What's for supper? I was always hungry. I always asked that question. My mom, what's for supper? Whatever's on the stove, she'd tell me. What's for supper? But if we're really honest, we probably shared this expression in our youth and maybe even today. It's not fair. Or you might have said, that's not fair. Have you ever used that expression? Have you ever said that in life? Or made that observation in life? You are sick, you miss school, but all of a sudden, around two to three, you started feeling better. And you wanted to go out and play with your friends because all of a sudden they're out of school and they're playing and they're in your neighborhood and you say, I feel better, I wanna go play. And your mama says what? What did your mama say? Not a chance. You're not going out today. You've been sick all day. You missed school. I'm not letting you go out and play. And your response to that is, that's not fair. The children are out playing in the yard. Your parents make you do homework first. 
and you say, they're not doing their homework first. Why do I have to do my homework first? That's not fair. We do this quite often. If you're still not with me, try this experiment at the next fellowship when you see chocolate cake sitting there on the dessert table. You go get you a piece that's kind of small. You get you a piece kind of big. You walk up to your spouse. You hand that person the small piece. You keep the big piece. You see how that works. <laughs> that's not fair. We have this innate sense of wanting to know what's fair. But actually, our innate sense of fairness can be a powerful and good thing when it's developed spiritual maturity of justice. In Psalms 11, for example, in verse 7, this is what it says. For the Lord is righteous. Now, understand what he's saying here. Read that whole psalm sometime. You'll get the bigger picture of this. The Lord is righteous. In order for you to understand what justice is, what is really fair, you really have to be a person of integrity and have to be a person of knowing what is right all the time. Amen? I don't know what's right all the time. Consequently, I don't see what's fair all the time necessarily. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. God loves justice. Upright men shall see his face. God wants us to do what's just. Or right and that can be a good thing in life we are called to that we are to right the world's wrong God is going to right the world's wrongs in life somewhere along the line in fact that's one of the last lessons Jesus teaches in Matthew chapter 25 when he shares this in the judgment scene I was hungry and you did what I was thirsty and you did what I was naked I was without clothes and you I was without a place to stay and you gave me a do you see what God is doing? God's innate sense of justice he teaches us to live. Kingdom people live with that sense of making things right when things are wrong. And that's a good thing in life. But there's a little bit of problem with that sometime. When we're, if you will, if there is one thing we're good at, we're born with this innate sense of fairness in our lives. As you're writing that very quickly, I have a video I want to share with you to help illustrate this. And this was an experiment that was done. In fact, this experiment has been done over and over again and several different animals, and it, it, it'll ring true to you. It'll ring true to you. So here you go. Watch this video. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more the because after study. we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group, they know each other, we take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do, and if you give both of them cucumber, for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, <laughs> but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, and then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. (laughs) 
so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. <laughs> Does this remind you of home? Did you hear what he said? They've done this experiment for uh, horses and dogs and different animals, and you know you could easily do it for human beings too, couldn't you? And and the and the capuchin monkeys were very happy. You could do this 25 times in a row. Put them side by side, give them cucumbers, and all 25 times, uh, the capuchin monkeys would eat the cucumber. We're very happy with it. But as soon as you give one something different than the other then their sense of that fairness. And I thought it was kind of interesting that the monkey on the left, when you were looking at it, uh, would test the rock to make sure it was giving them the right thing. Did you see it banging against the wall? Uh, that's, that's it, man. I, oh, where's my grape? It's just not fair. Life's not fair, you know? You know, where does that come from? Because let me ask you a question. Have you ever sensed that yourself? You see somebody else get something you didn't get, and they received a blessing you didn't receive, and you're thinking, well, that's not right. How come they got that? That doesn't seem fair to me, does it to you? Here's the problem with that. Here's the problem with that. Ah, I'll come back. I went ahead. Our innate sense of fairness tends to be egocentric, doesn't it? Our innate sense of fairness tends to be egocentric. Oh, uh, even in the animal kingdom, it's egocentric. It's not what is done to us. We're looking for what's done for us in life. We measure our sense of fairness in terms of our own wants, our own needs, our own expectations, and our own desires. That's how we measure that sense of fairness. Jesus addresses this issue in our lives on several occasions. In Matthew chapter 20, if you'll turn your Bible there, I want to illustrate. Jesus wants to illustrate. Jesus wants to teach us this. Because this is something, a part of our fallen human nature, that we have to battle against in life. And this is how important it is for us to understand that. Because our sense of fairness can change our attitude pretty quickly, can it? Our sense of fairness, when we think we're treated unequally, unfairly, we become resentful, we can become hateful, we can become mean, and our hearts can become hardened and far from God. This is a tool Satan uses. So it's a tool, it's something we ought to be aware of and be on guard for. So Matthew chapter 20, if you'll turn there, you'll see this lesson that Jesus is telling us this story to illustrate the hardness of our heart or the capacity for the hardness of our heart. So, Matthew chapter 20, uh, let's unpack this together. I'm going to read part of the verses and, and we'll just kind of unpack it as we go along and we'll make some commentary. And then I have three points of choices I'm going to share with you at the end of this lesson. For the kingdom of heaven is like, Jesus does this all the time. When he came in and began his ministry, he came in introducing us to the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, my world is not your world. I'm going to show you my world and invite you to my world and tell you how to get to my world, how to live in my world, how to enjoy my world. And he calls it life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. That's his kingdom. Okay, so he's helping us understand the framework, how we think, how we act. He's transforming us, if you will, and teaching us a lesson. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in the vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them to the vineyard. That's about six in the morning. About the third hour, about 9 a.m., he went out and saw there were others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in the vineyard and I will pay you whatever you right. So they went. Now, he did this again about the sixth hour, noon, and then about the ninth hour, and then at the eleventh hour, same thing about the eleventh hour. He went out and did this. Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one's hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. Okay, pause there. Let me give you a, a, a historical framework to that because this is a little different than the way we live. Uh, if you've got a job, you've got a steady job, you go there and work, you know, 35, 40 hours a week, right? And that's pretty much steady income. You, you don't worry about it. You don't think about it. That's not the world in which Jesus is teaching here. Uh, most people did not have a steady income. Most people lived daily, just daily, a daily grind. Uh, in fact, it's insightful to look at the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus teaches us how to pray. When he taught them how to pray, he says, give thanks for what bread? Your daily bread, daily. That doesn't resonate with us because we don't worry about daily bread because we have a pantry. 
in our house. We don't worry about daily bread because we have a refrigerator full of food or a freezer full of food. And if you don't have that, you've got a credit card, debit card, and grocery stores all around. And if you're not satisfied with what we've got, we're going to get a Publix real soon too, I understand. We ha- we're abundant. Uh, this does not resonate well with us. I want it to resonate with us. Here's what they did every single day. Whether you're healthy, unhealthy, whether you're fortunate or unfortunate, uh, no matter whether you're old or young, you had a provision as the, as the husband, as the, as the leader in your family, to provide for your family, amen? That was your job. So you went to the marketplace, you stood in the marketplace, you did this every day, that's just, your, just what you did. And you waited for some wealthy landowner or somebody else to come by and, and look for you to hire somebody. The sole purpose you're there, you're thinking you're there because there's a bunch of hungry mouths, there's a bunch of hungry people that you're responsible for that you love dearly and you want to provide for them. And you're thinking, man, I hope I get hired today. I hope I get hired today. I hope I get a job today. Man, if I can get hired first thing this morning and work all day long, that would be fantastic. I can come home and my family would be so happy and so excited and I can provide. Wouldn't that be great? Amen? Amen? Wouldn't that be great? But, you know, when you come in and you're a wealthy landowner and you're wanting somebody to work all day long, who do you pick first? Do you pick the old person or the young person? Kit, do they pick you or do they pick Chip? Yeah, they're going to go with Chip. <laughs> okay. Now, if they had a choice between Chip and one of these college guys, which one are they going to pick? Sorry, Chip. You're out now, bud. You're out. Now, are they going to pick the healthy or the unhealthy standing in the marketplace? They're going to pick the healthy. So you had to be pretty fortunate to be the first go around to get something. And then those guys go off and they decide, okay, I'll give you a denarius. That was, that was a typical day's wage. You get that day's wage, you go to work. How are you feeling that you got selected early in the morning to go provide for your family with that whole group there? Aren't you feeling pretty good? Yes, I'm picked. I'm going, man, I'm excited. I'm going to get to take care of my family. We've got a home today. And now you go to the next group, 9 o'clock, and each hour as you progress through there. Now, Understand this, those guys that are standing around there, and he says, why are you standing around? Because obviously nobody's hired. It's not, they're lazy. They're not lazy. They're not trying to get out of work. These are the people that are older, unhealthy, or for whatever reason, didn't get picked the first time around, second time around, third time around, fourth time around. Now, when they get picked the fifth time around, what do you think those people are thinking? Yes. Yes, Lord. This is exciting. Oh. Man, what a relief this is to be able to go out and, and get at least a little something today. I want, I'm not going home empty-handed. Are you getting this? I'm not going home empty-handed. Everybody's pretty grateful. Everybody's pretty grateful. Everybody's a capuchin monkey and eating happily cucumbers. Everybody's eating the cucumbers and very excited about it. As he said, it's mostly water anyway, but... They're just really excited about it. Now, let's come back to the story. Now that you, we understand what Jesus is teaching, go back down to verse 8. Now, when evening came, it's time for payday. The owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired. They've been there about an hour and going to the first. Now, you're all in line. You're all in the little cages looking at each other. And the workers who were hired on the 11th hour came, and they received a denarius. Now, if you were hired last, what are you thinking? What's, your, what's our human nature? What's our egocentric human nature? Cha-ching, bonus day to day. They only worked an hour, and they got what we agreed to at the beginning. So, when those came who were hired first, they expect to receive more. But each of them, now I want you to understand this. See, underline this in your Bible, mark it in there. Those that were hired first, that worked all day long, they had their expectation changed. Make sure you get that. They had their expectation changed. Happiness is always determined by expectation. You can write that down. If you're not happy, change your what? Expectation. Do you hear this? Change your expectation. I told you this illustration before. When my son was really small and got birthday gifts, he figured out the gifts part of it. Grandparents who lived far away, lived in Miami, so they would send a check down. My, both, both grandparents would send a birthday card and a check. My son would open the birthday card, was little interest in the card, more interest in the toys and the food than anything, and a check would fall out, and my son would look at it and toss it over the card, not seeing any value to that. Until we took him down to the bank, remember, 
He cashed it. We took him down to Toys R Us and said, Grandma and Grandpa wanted you to have something that you wanted to have. You have money now. This is the money. You have this much money. You can go find the toy you want and get what you want. And they're like, awesome. <laughs> this is cool. Now, the next year, when he got the card, he wasn't as disappointed with the card and the little check that fell out. Why? Because his expectation was changed. Happiness is always determined by expectation. Now, the people that were hired first for the 12 hours, their expectation when they said, we agree to a denarius, they were very happy at the beginning, right? We're picked first. We're going to get paid. We're going to take care of our family. But then they're standing in line and watching those that only worked an hour, those that were less healthy, those that were older, those that had more trouble providing for their family, get the same thing they were getting, and their expectation changed. All of a sudden, it didn't become about them. It became about who? Who did it come about? Them. It became about them. And their heart began to get hardened. They expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, instead of saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for picking me, thank you for providing for me, thank you that I can go home and feed my family, all that gratitude away and turned into grumbling. Are you with me so far? Turned into grumbling. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And now watch how they reframe this. Watch how they reframe this. From an egocentric, self-centered point of view, they reframe this statement. This is from their perspective and not knowing the heart of God. And you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But Jesus reframes it back and says, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? And you might add in, and weren't you pretty stinking happy about it at first? Take your pay and go. I want to give to the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you, listen to this, envious? Envious, because I am generous and gracious. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Jesus tells us this story to illustrate the hardness of heart with those who deem themselves righteous, those that deem themselves more worthy than others, begrudging mercy and grace of God. Now, this will make more sense to you if you understand the context, the further context. If you'll jump back one chapter in Matthew with me, very quickly, you'll see what he's te teaching us. Jesus has this encounter with a rich young man who says, <coughs> Teacher, what good thing must I do, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Teacher, what do I got to do to be good enough for your kingdom? What do I got to do to earn my way in? And Jesus sets this up pretty nicely with this fella when he tells them these things. First of all, he says, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. God is good, church, all the time, and all the time. Okay, that's, uh, if you try to measure goodness in any other framework, you're off base. We're, we miss it. We miss it. The only one who is good is God. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. <coughs> obey the commandments. If you want to enter, Jesus said, you want to be perfect, you want to earn your own way, you obey the commandments. Your first response to that from an egocentric point of view is, all of them or which ones? <laughs> which ones are you counting? Which ones are in? So Jesus sets this up because Jesus knows this man, he knows his hearts. And he picks out random commandments here because he knows this man can respond positively to it. So he says, do not murder. Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother and love your neighbors yourself. Ah, these I've kept, the young man said, what, shall I, what do I lack? Man, I'm in. And Jesus answered, if you want to be perfect, if you want to be perfect, you want to be perfect. And you're going to hear this word perfection on a couple of occasions in the text. And I'm going to come back to Matthew 5 with this. Uh, do not misunderstand this word in the Greek. It does not mean that you're the same equal with God in perfection in the sense of being holy without sin. That's not what the word means. The word perfect in the Greek text means, uh, think of it this way, having a purpose, having a destination, and getting to the finish line. Here's the finish line right here. He says, you finished. You finished your purpose. You finished your, your, your goal. 
God has got a goal for us in life. You've gotten to the end of your journey in life and you, you journeyed with God. He changed your story. You finished. He says that's what perfect is in life. It's not you being perfect. It's God working in you, helping you get to the finish line to be perfect. That's what the word is indicating for us. So, if you want to be perfect, you want to finish the race and really be a part of the kingdom of God, here's what you need to do. You go sell your possessions, give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And you know the response of the rich man, don't you? He said, oh, wow. He had a lot of stuff. What's he essentially asking? What's, he, what's Jesus essentially challenging this man to? He's challenging his heart. This man trusted himself. Jesus is inviting them to a new life, a gracious life. By the way, we're all pretty well off, right? Amen? We're all pretty well off. Is that your money? But you say, well, I worked really hard for it, Joe. I, I worked. Who gave you the ability to work? Who gave you the ability to think? Who gave you the opportunity to do what you do? Was it not God? Everything we have belongs to who? The cattle on a thousand hills belong to him. Every blessing you have, every grape, cucumber you have is a gift from God Almighty. God is challenging us to have that framework. We survive by the grace of God every day. We're not in control. We don't control the spinning of the earth. We don't control the moon coming across and giving us this wondrous eclipse tomorrow that might be pretty cool, to see, that will be pretty cool to see. And I got three more glasses in case somebody doesn't have glasses. <laughs> I'm gonna get inundated for saying that. <laughs> but that's okay. God gives us all these wonderful things. And we need to understand they're a gift from a gracious and good God. And when God gives gracious and good gifts, what does he expect his people to do? To be grateful as well and to share. So it's within that framework that he shares this thought with us. Now, this grace and mercy, Jesus talks about this, and he calls us to live this same lifestyle. And I'm going to invite you to Matthew chapter 5, because it's expounding on the same thing in the Sermon Mount Kingdom Living. Now I'm going to look at verse 43 through 44 very quickly, and then I'm going to make these last three points. We have some choices to make, and we'll get back to the cards. Here's what Jesus is calling us to. Because God is good, good and gracious and loving all the time, He's calling us to live the same lifestyle, to have the same attitude. Then when we get to live that lifestyle, then we understand what fair really is and what justice really is in life. Because mercy, grace, love define justice and define righteousness. Here's what he says to us in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. And pray for those that persecute you. Is that fair? If your enemy is your enemy and he's doing horrible, wretched, terrible, no good, very bad things to you, does it seem fair to love them when they hate you? If they're not doing good for you, does it seem fair that you should pray for them? He's not, we don't have that sense of fairness yet. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the Son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those that love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the pagans do that? Now here's this word perfect again. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Reach the goal. Jesus is working on us, changing us each and every day in our lives. And we have some choices to make about our attitude and how we think about life. We are not good judge, judges of what's fair until we learn this trait in our lives. God is good all the time. God is gracious all the time. God loves all the time. And God calls his people to be gracious when? All the time. To be merciful when? All the time. To be loving when? All the time. It's the only way. 
It's the only way we can finish the race. That is, be perfect. This is the guide. These are our values. This is what we hold dearly to. This is where justice really makes a difference in our world. And folks, the world needs to see some of that, doesn't it? And we are his people and call to that in life. So here's some choices we need to make in life. Very quickly, three things. First, we can be grateful or we can be grumpy. We have that choice, don't we, in life? We can do that. The Bible tells us, Jesus teaches us, to rejoice with those that weep with those that share in their burden, share in their joy. Don't be jealous. Don't be grumpy about it. Be happy about it. Because God chooses to be gracious and good to the just and the unjust. How do you think the world's going to change? The world's not going to change with grumpy Christians. I, I think that's an oxymoron. You can't even say that. The world's going to change with grateful Christians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. How can you do that? That doesn't make sense to me. No, of course not in a worldly sense. But it does when I trust Jesus with all my heart. Because God is good all the time to me. Be grateful. You remember the guys that were hired first were filled with gratitude. And at the end, they were grumpy. What changed? Only their expectation and let the world be about them. It's only in the crucified life that we begin to understand how we can live that way and make a real difference in the lives of others. Here's the second thing. We can see others with hearts of compassion or as competition in our lives. This parable is told in the context of Matthew 19, as I said. This guy was not very grateful for what he had. He trusted in his own righteousness. If you look back in verse 21, in fact, I'm going to read that in verse 19 again just to remind us. This is what Jesus says. If you want to be perfect, go sell all your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Come follow me. Now let me ask you this question. If Jesus were to say that to you and me today, he says, uh, if you really want to follow me and you really want to do this, uh, and, and he may be calling you to do this, maybe not. He's at, certainly asking us to be generous. But if, if the Lord Almighty directly says to you, go sell everything you got and then follow him, what can you trust about that? Here's what you can trust. Is God still going to take care of you? Amen. He's going to take care of you. It may not come in the form, it may not come in the form of you directly giving everything you have away, which sounds foolish to the world, but it may come in this form. God may be calling you to go somewhere. God may be calling you to do something. God may be asking you in your heart to go to somebody that you're not having a great relationship with and you've been uh, jealous, whatever it is. Uh, there's a brokenness in that relationship. God may be saying to you, Go sell, your, just go sell your pride. Go sell your ego. Go sell all of that. Get rid of all of that. Follow me and go practice this graciousness in other people's lives. Go practice this love in other people's lives. Go practice this love in other people's lives. You go see what happens. See if God doesn't fill your heart with his spirit and you walk away with an incredible joy in your life. See if that doesn't change. I guarantee you it will. It will. Don't see people as competition, but see people with compassion, just as Jesus did. You know, here's what's sad. These guys that were healthy and well, that got hired first, should have looked at these older people, these people that were not as healthy, and should have been rejoicing with them. These guys were going to go home and not be able to feed their family. How dispassionate is that? So God calls us to a different level of thinking, to look outside of ourselves and understand that God's storehouse can never be emptied. You can never outgive God. You can never outserve God. You can never outlove God. Give it away. Give it away. Let Him come back and bless you with that in your life. And here's the last point. We, you can trust the heart and sovereignty of God to, or allow the weight of resentment and envy and ego to harden your hearts in life. One of my favorite passages of Scripture, my children know, that all my children, my whole family knows this passage, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I got a... Uh, the, Churches I've been at knows it's one of my favorite passages. In fact, I got a page from a 1614 edition of the King James Bible in my office. It's a pretty old text, and it's got Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It doesn't read quite this way, but it just says the same thing. My son, do not forget my teaching, and keep my commands in your heart, for they prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love... 
and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and men. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Our sense of fairness. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trusting in yourself, your ego only hardens your heart. God can shape and mold and give joy and peace to your heart in ways we'd never understand. Okay, everybody pull your cards out. Here's what I want you to do. Everybody pull your cards out. Lesson's almost yours. I want you to take your cards, and if you haven't filled it out, continue to fill it out. And what I'd like for you to do is this week do this. I'm challenging you to do this. If you haven't done this, take some cards. We'll put these cards back on the Welcome Center. If you didn't get one, you can get one before you leave. Really, truly do this. This is between you and the Lord. I'm asking you to do this between you and the Lord. I'm challenging you to do this between you and the Lord. Really do write down some resentment, grudge, and envy because you, you can't be grateful and envious at the same time. You can't be grateful and carry a grudge at the same time. You can't do any of those. They don't coexist in your heart. It's like faith and fear. They don't coexist in your heart. You have to make a choice. Here's your choice. Fill these out. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn them upside down, right here where you can't read them. Mix the cards up where you don't know which one is. And I want you to hold them out in your hand like this. You got them in your hands like this? Try this. Put this in your hands like this. Now, which one weighs more? Which one weighs more? They weigh the same, don't they? It's just a piece of paper. <laughs> it weighs the same. You know, but if I turn them over and I look, oh, here are my resentments. Here are my grudges. Here's where I'm envious. I wrote those, mine down here. I have mine. Though the card, these cards weigh the same, this card right here, when I think about it and let it dwell in my mind and my heart, it weighs my heart down. It blackens my heart. It ruins my relationships with others. It takes me to places far away from God. It's a burden. It's a burden. And you know this is true, church. It's a burden. It's almost impossible. It is impossible to bear. It will take you down a dark path away from God. Yet, if I instead I choose to allow this to reside in my heart, counting my blessings, and in turn giving thanks to God, for all that he's given to me. And not just that, if I can turn around and look at you and you and you and you and see where God is blessing you in life, and instead of me being resentful, I could say, wow, let me rejoice with you. And I could honestly say, God, man, they obviously needed a perk in their life. They needed this boost in their life. They needed this blessing in their life. You gave it to them. Praise God. Praise God for that. Isn't that great? And our attitudes change and all of a sudden, we really can rejoice. And you know, when somebody's carrying a burden and they're hurting in life, and you go weep with them, and you share in that burden, that turns out to be a blessing. And again, you get to rejoice and give thanks to God. Hey, church, you have a choice. Jesus died on the cross so you can make this choice. He died so you can make this choice. If he did not die, there is no choice. There is no blessing. There is no hope. There is no grace. There is no mercy. There is no love. But because of all those things called who he is all the time, we have a choice because he made a choice for us. This morning, if you're not a child of God, and you've not given your life and your heart to Jesus Christ, he died so you could have this choice. Life forever, joy purpose, perfection, wonder, the wonder of God in your life. And we're going to invite you to him. We're going to have some shepherds up front, some shepherds in the back. And if we can help you in any way with your walk with God and making life better, please come as we stand together and as we sing. It's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. Sing that no, no one keeps singing no, no
Megan's came this morning and sharing her blessings and what the lesson would mean to her today. Uh, we tend to have our blessings and we need to thank God daily for them. Let us pray. Father, we're just thankful for her Vegas as she comes this morning and she's sharing her blessings with us. Father, we just pray that each day we stop and think about our blessings that you give us and lay all our burdens to you and let you take care of those. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I think I finally got there and about worked my way out of a job. They put the announcements I usually make up there on the screen. In a couple more weeks, y'all won't be seeing me anymore. So, uh, just want to tell you, we have, uh, our, our elders are really top of the line thinkers. Because I was at dinner with Lloyd a couple weeks ago when we were talking about the eclipse. He said, aren't you glad it's not going to happen at night? <laughs> okay. Took some of y'all a while, didn't it? <laughs> oh, well. Um, next week, next week, College students are going to be back. We're going to be here. We're going to ask them to eat with us and spend time with us. And we're going to wear purple, college side purple, OK? Everybody got one? Well, most everybody. I know I've seen lots of them. So remember to do that. Show them we're unified here. And, uh, that, and we're pulling for them at least half their colors. If you need to wear purple and gold, that'd be all right, too. You know, Joe told us happiness was determined by our expectations, and I remember a saying that I heard when I was a kid, long before I ever met Jesus, uh, said, if the world is wrong, write your own self. You know, and that's real easy to say, but it's hard to do until you get Jesus in your heart. And so let's try and change the world by having Jesus in our hearts. And oh, by the way, one more time, We've had a son up here praying and a father up here praying. Isn't it great to have a family like that? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. With that thought in mind, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we do glorify you, and we thank you for giving us the opportunity to come together this morning in Christian fellowship to praise and glorify your holy name. And now, Father, as we are about to go our separate ways, we, pr we pray that you will be with us, continue to guide us in ways that will help our lights to shine brighter, in ways that will strengthen our faith so that we can become better examples of true Christians to all of those in the world around us. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen. <laughs> 